Good, e good evening and hello. Welcome to tonight's webinar and thank you for joining us. My name is Rain Adman. I'm the Puget Sound Senior Campaign Manager at Washington Conservation Action. I'm excited to be your moderator tonight. I am joined by my colleagues from Friends of the San Juans, Communities for a Healthy Bay, Mount Baker Group of the Sierra Club, and Resources. We are located on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. These lands, the shorelines, and waterways are part of the greater Salish Sea that the Coast Salish people have called their home since time immemorial. Ever since the catastrophic Exxon Valdez oil tanker spill in 1989 that spilled 11 million gallons of crude into the Puget Prince William Sound in Alaska, Washington State has been vigilant to prevent oil spills as well as being prepared and have the resources necessary to respond to an oil spill. However, improvements in our oil spill prevention, preparedness, and response efforts tend to take place after an oil spill happens, after the fact. I can come up with a few regulations and requirements that came into effect following an oil spill here in Washington State. We now have a permanently funded and year-round ocean-going rescue tug at Neo Bay, almost like a fire engine on the water. Oil tankers must have double hulls, have tug escorts, and must have on board a Puget Sound pilot with local knowledge and experience to navigate the vessel through the Salish Sea to its destination. We require pre-booming for any over-the-water transfers of petroleum products and we have increased pipeline safety requirements. Despite these regulations, facilities like oil refineries, marine terminals, and pipelines termed class one facilities are not required to have financial responsibility coverage. Yet there are approximately 30 such facilities throughout the state, including Pasco, Spokane, Grace Harbor, Tacoma, Vancouver, Seattle, Anacortes, and Bellingham, a lot of places. Ironically, vessels have financial responsibility requirements for the last 20 years. So why aren't these class one facilities required to do that? That's what we're gonna to address today. And at this moment, Washington State's Department of Ecology is in the process of establishing a statewide regulation to ensure oil handling facilities have adequate financial resources to pay for the response and damages arising from an oil spill. This process is a result of a collective effort among environmental organizations and state legislators who helped pass legislation in Olympia back in 2022. The passage of the bill directs ecology to adopt rules regarding financial responsibility requirements for oil handling facilities and vessels and to establish a process for requesting a Washington state certificate of financial responsibility. Regulated entities quote, must demonstrate financial responsibility for re response cleanup costs and as necessary, compensate the state and affected federally recognized Indian tribes, counties and cities for damages that might occur during a spill, end quote. That's directly from the legislation. As now written, the proposed state regulation is dangerously inadequate and is based on data that's more than 30 years old. You will hear more about that from our speakers. Today, we have an opportunity to be proactive. We need to be prepared and we need to have the financial responsibility requirements in place and an amount that will pay for the full cost before a class one facility's large oil spill occurs. The stakes are high. We, are, we all treasure the Salish Sea, the juxtaposition of the coastlines and cityscapes and snow capped peaks in all directions where lush forests on distant ridgelines seem to stitch earth to sky, where from a ferry you can glimpse pods of whales, and where Coast Salish peoples <clears throat> have lived since time immemorial. Tonight's workshop is in advance of the public hearings that Ecology is hosting next week. We want you to be informed and ready to provide comments to Ecology. That is Department of Ecology. We'll get started with two presentations, followed by a Q&A, we will then provide you with some tips and guidance for providing effective testimony at the upcoming hearings or even submitting them in writing to Ecology. So I'm delighted to uh, provide you with our first presenter, uh, Lovell Pratt. 
is the Marine Protection and Policy Director at Friends of the San Juans. Level. Thank you, Rain, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. So state law requires ecology, oh, you can go back to the first slide, sorry. State law requires ecology to identify the financial responsibility amounts that would be needed to compensate the state, tribes, counties, and cities for oil spill response and damage costs caused by class one facilities. These are the state's refineries, pipelines, and other large bulk oil handling facilities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Back in 2006, Ecology identified what the cost to the state would be for a large oil spill, $10.8 billion and 165,000 jobs. However, Ecology has proposed a maximum financial responsibility amount that may only address a small fraction of these costs. Ecology's proposed 300 million maximum financial responsibility requirement for class one facilities is based on California's regulations, which were established in 1995 and based on a 1993 study that identified the costs of an oil spill at 12,500 to $18,900 per barrel. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this pie chart represents a large oil spill that costs $10.8 billion. The proposed 300 million maximum financial responsibility requirement would cover less than 3% of these total costs. The Federal Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund provides up to $1 billion per oil spill event for response and damage costs, which combined with the 300 million would cover just 12% of the total cost. Who would pay for the remaining costs? There is unlimited liability for oil spills in Washington state. This means that there is no limit to what a responsible party would be required to pay when they cause an oil spill. However, financial responsibility requirements are needed to ensure that bankruptcy won't occur before all the response and damage costs have been paid. Washington state taxpayers, the state and local governments and business and tribes should not have to pay for these costs. Next slide, please. So this spreadsheet has a lot of information, please bear with me. The first column includes just some of Washington state's class one facilities the five Salish Sea refineries, and the Puget Sound Spur of Canada's Trans Mountain Pipeline. The fourth column includes the worst case spill volume for each of these facilities. For refineries, ecology currently defines worst case spill volume by the size of each facility's largest above ground storage tank. The fifth column shows ecology's calculations for the cost of a worst case spill. As you can see in the seventh column, even using the 30 year old low estimate of 12,500 per barrel as the basis for these spill costs, the 300 million maximum financial responsibility requirement would only cover a small fraction of the total cost for these class one facilities oil spills. Next slide, please. This 300 million maximum financial responsibility requirement for class one facilities is the same amount that is currently required for passenger vessels with a fuel capacity of at least 6,000 gallons. The justification for the proposed financial responsibility requirements is the availability and affordability of financial responsibility. Ecology was also tasked with considering the frequency of operations at these facilities, the current cost of oil spill response, and the current cost of damages that could result from class one facility oil spills, but this has not been done. Next slide, please. The construction of Canada's Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project is more than 98% complete. It's expected to be operational in the second quarter of this year and will increase the pipeline's current capacity 
by 590,000 barrels per day. The pipeline transports Alberta tar sands, also called bitumen or diluted bitumen or dilbit. Tar sands products can have higher oil spill response and damage costs than spills of other oil products. For example, the response, remediation, and restoration costs for the 2010 tar sands crude oil pipeline spill into the Kalamazoo River was over $1.2 billion or $60,153 per barrel. The impacts of potential spills of the products that are transported through the Trans Mountain Pipeline are very serious. According to Ecology, quote, bitumen from Alberta, even once diluted, is uniquely difficult to remove after a spill because of its properties. Alberta bitumen oils are potentially sinking oils or some portion may sink after weathering, which renders ineffective conventional techniques to contain and remove oil from the water surface. Potentially sinking oil poses a risk, a risk of contamination to sediments and their ecosystems, which include economically and culturally valuable shellfish and fisheries." Unquote. A spill from the Puget Sound spur of the Trans Mountain Pipeline could impact the Nooksack River, Lower Skagit River, Samish River, Sumas River, Swinomish Channel, Padilla Bay, the Salish Sea, and all the human and animal communities that surround and live within these waters. The higher spill response and damage costs for tar sand products needs to be addressed in the financial responsibility requirements. And now I'll turn it back over to Rain. Thank you, Lovell. Our next presentation will be on externalized costs that the oil industry never has to pay. In economics, an externality or external cost is an indirect cost or benefit to an uninvolved third party that arises as an effect of another party's activity. Externalities can be considered as unpriced goods involved in either consumer or producer market transactions. Air pollution from motor vehicles is one clear example. Our presenter is Rick Egger. He's a co-chair of the Mount Baker Group of the Sierra Club. And before retiring from law, Rick litigated cases brought by the oil industry during the 1990s against the insurance industry, including some of Rick's clients. These cases resolved who was responsible to pay for cleaning up thousands of polluted sites across the continent created by big oil. Rick, take it away. Okay, thank you, Rain. During the course of this rulemaking process, ecology has succumb to claims by members of the petroleum industry that having to obtain insurance for more than $300 million in annual coverage is either impossible or too expensive. This makes little sense. As one who has litigated against major players in the oil industry, I know they spend extraordinary amounts every year on their insurance coverage and have more in the budget if needed. Also, insurance is rarely, if ever, impossible to obtain. It just depends on how much a buyer wants to spend. The insurance industry ensures huge risks if you're willing to pay the premium. And the oil industry has lots to spend on premiums. They are not needy. With just this much in mind, ecology should require at least $1 billion in annual insurance coverage for class one facilities. But there's another more structurally fundamental reason that ecology should not listen to claims of poverty from this industry. That reason shows why the industry is not a charity case. Charity case. That phrase conjures up an image of someone poor and shabby, down and out, in desperate need of help, only too happy to accept any donation. That's reflected in Google's formal definition of charity case. A person or group regarded as needing help or financial support. What doesn't come to mind is a one percenter seeking support. And yet, that is exactly what we do in subsidizing the oil industry. Treat it like a charity case. 
This is apparent in the approximately $20 billion of government subsidies given to the industry annually. But the far bigger, though less apparent subsidy is externalized costs. Like Rain told you, externalized costs are simply those generated by any industry, but paid for by society. They are essentially subsidies to the industry creating them. There are many examples of externalized costs and the oil industry has more than its share. Perhaps the biggest externalized cost big oil avoids comes from having a license to pollute for free. Harvard researchers found pollutants from oil and gas combustion, just the combustion of oil and gas products, cause 8.7 million premature deaths annually. And that's just combustion. Then there's the growing costs from intensifying disasters to which petroleum products and the carbon they create heavily contribute, like climate change driven wildfires, floods, and droughts. By the end of this century, it is estimated to cost the federal budget $2 trillion annually and reduce U.S. gross domestic product 3 to 10%. The International Monetary Fund estimates the license to pollute is a $5.4 trillion annual subsidy worldwide. In the U.S., that's $646 billion every year. And yet this almost certainly undercounts the true cost. The London School of Economics reports that studies often underestimate the harm of climate dangers by not accounting for how hazards can cascade across ecological and economic systems. These cause irreparable damage to our well-being, ecosystems, biodiversity, and economy. Externalized costs start with the often free or minimal cost of obtaining the land from which to extract fossil fuels. On federal lands where much extractive activity occurs, mineral rights are basically free to extractive industry. And oil and gas leases are inexpensive compared to the value received. State and private lands are not as cheap, but the industry's financial power and leverage always favors it in purchase and lease negotiations. And then there's the price of extracting these dirty fuels. It's our health, especially our children's health. From higher rates of birth defects to childhood leukemia in children, to higher rates of cancer and various cardiovascular maladies, communities around oil and gas extraction sites pay an especially high price. And then there's the harder to quantify, but enormous costs of cleaning up air and water and soil pollution, not to mention the environmental injustice and inequity suffered by communities neighboring refining and production facilities. For a sense of how widespread spill damage might be, think what a large spill in the Puget Sound would affect. The water quality itself, which affects all living things in the sound, the contamination of eelgrass and other sound flora, harming all things living in, in and around said flora, which is many varieties of fish, starfish, anemones, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, seals, sea lions, etc. Contamination of coral, oysters, crab, mussels, clams, and other shellfish. Contamination of fish and marine mammals, including orca and humpback whales. The damage to boats, ships, harbors, and other marine facilities. The impact on the local economy, starting with the fishing fleets, but cascading into all sectors of the land-based economy as well and the potentially years long impact on the local economy and ecology and the property damage suffered by all those with coast property. And I've probably missed a few things. It boils down to this, it's textbook economics that the price of a good should reflect its true cost. Yet big oil avoids this rule by externalizing costs. And with all the savings from passing on externalized costs, Big oil spends billions on disinformation, false doubts, climate obstruction, and political dark money to preserve its various subsidies. And why not protect possibly the most lucrative subsidies in human history? Unfortunately, the Department of Ecology apparently buys into this why not thinking. In determining how much financial responsibility should be demonstrated by the industry for its biggest and most dangerous facilities, Ecology's rulemaking focuses entirely on unclear, undefined, and probably provided by industry claims of what is affordable. 
Ecology has never pointed to a neutral, unbiased assessment of what is truly affordable for one of the richest industries on earth, an industry that benefits massively every year from passing on extraordinary externalized costs. And ecology focuses on this false sense of unaffordability while ignoring before other considerations it is legally mandated to address. What would be a worst case oil spill? Spilled oil cleanup costs, frequency of operations that could create spills and damages that could result from spills. It ignores the statutorily mandated requirements. Not following its own controlling statute is bad enough, but ecology makes it worse by ignoring the vast array of externalized costs that the industry foists off on society. In doing this, ecology betrays the society it is supposed to protect and violates its own mission as per its own website to protect, preserve, and enhance Washington's environment for current and future generations. That's ecology's language. If society must bear the burden and harm of the externalized costs that make the oil industry so incredibly profitable, then the least that ecology can do is recognize these costs and the huge benefit big oil gains from not having to pay them. If society must bear these costs, then ecology must require the industry to do what is necessary to assure that financial resources are ready and waiting to pay for the costs of containing, cleaning up, and compensating for any industry-created oil spill, large or small. Failure by ecology to do this abuses society's charity to an industry that doesn't deserve it. When you comment next week, please tell Ecology that at least $1 billion in annual financial responsibility must be required. Thank you. And thank you, Rick. Uh, wow. Uh, many, many years of experience really uh, brings to bear like the need for strong financial responsibility requirements here at this moment here in the state. Um, we are at a point that we are going to provide an opportunity for you to ask questions and our speakers and panelists will answer those. So um, we have been monitoring the Q&A uh, box and we have a few questions for Lovell and Rick and uh, Eddie. Uh, feel free to join uh, in and Logan. Um, so we'll get started and we'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how many questions we have. And then we'll get into the uh, how to provide effective and efficient testimony um, section of our program. All right. Um, Lovell or Rick, why aren't vessels included in this rule? There are a lot of oil tankers, barges and ATBs in the Salish Sea and the Columbia River. So why aren't vessels included? Uh, I can answer that, Rain. <clears throat> so vessels actually are included in the rule and uh, there have been financial responsibility requirements for vessels uh, for the past approximate 20 years. And any changes to requirements for um, financial responsibility for vessels was included in the bill language. So it, it's not part of the rulemaking. Ecology doesn't have to come up with what amount it should be. That was already set um, by the legislation that was passed previously. And a follow-up question, how much of a financial uh, financial responsibility requirement do vessels have right now? Yeah, so for tankers, and uh, barges that carry oil in bulk, their financial responsibility requirements are $1 billion. Um, as I said in my presentation, for passenger vessels that have at least 6,000 gallons of propulsion fuel, they're required to have the same financial responsibility amount as the class one facilities, the $300 million. Um, what is, uh, what vessels have in place is what's called a P&I club or a, um, it's a insurance, it's a, um, I forget what it's called here, um, but basically they pool uh, the costs of having insurance 
and um, and that way they make it more affordable to provide that coverage for the various vessels that require that. Um, mm. yeah. So do you think- and, uh, I, I, and I think one thing that is, is a significant option is for these facilities, these class one facilities to do the same thing that vessels have done and establish these mutual insurance clubs uh, to make that coverage more affordable. And the coverage larger, like a billion dollars or two billion or 10 billion. Well, you know, I think we need, we still need to find out what is the real cost of um, what would need to be paid to compensate the state, tribes, counties, cities uh, for uh, oil spill response and damage costs. And and that, you know, in today's dollars, not $1995. Great, thanks Lovell. Uh, another question here, who has responsibility for oil spills on land? I can try to answer that one too. You know, first of all, the responsible party, the person responsible for the spill is responsible for addressing the cost of the response and the damages, whether it's on land or in the water. Um, there are federal, what they call on-scene coordinators, and it's either the US Coast Guard for um, spills in the water or the EPA for spills on land, inland spills. Um, and then there are local representatives, tribal representatives, um, who um, participate along with a responsible party in the spill response. But right. uh, as we said earlier, the financial responsibility requirements are really important just to make sure that bankruptcy doesn't occur before all the costs have been paid. Yeah. Um, there will be major spills after an earthquake. We live in that kind of geological sensitive uh, bioregion. What about the risks of an earthquake in the Salish Sea area? Uh, I think this is directed at Rick. Sure. So um, in a major catastrophe like that, you're going to get a, a, a huge amount of, of federal involvement um and so that kind of makes it a little hard to predict exactly what what would uh you know who would pay for what the, the feds would be in um covering a lot of costs and and uh, damage issues but um the the so <clears throat> let me get a little wonky here pardon me for major industries like this, the first million dollars or so of the insurance is self-insured, meaning, you know, if it's British Petroleum, they provide that first million dollars of coverage. And then there are layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of insurance above that that they buy from various members of the insurance industry. Their um, self-insurance it, you know, it's, it's them basically insuring themselves. So there's not a policy that dictates what the coverages are or aren't. So self-insurance is probably, I, I can't speak to the policies I'm actually seeing them, but because it's self-insurance, they're not likely to exclude earthquake damage. Now, once you get above this, the $1 million or so self-insurance layer, you get what's called um, uh, excess layers of, ins of insurance. And um, those excess layers basically get cheaper and cheaper the higher and higher you go from that million dollars. So if you're insuring at $100 million, it's a lot cheaper than insuring the first million dollars because $99 million has to be used up before your insurance becomes available. And those layers tend to basically fill the gaps of the coverages below them so that the first excess layer, umbrella coverage is what it's called, will fill will cover the 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 whatever isn't covered in the primary layer um and so that would probably uh wind up not having an earthquake exclusion and so would the layers above it this is somewhat speculative on my part because without actually seeing the policies i can't be sure but this is what i would expect to be the case 
I hope that made sense. Sorry for being wonky. Rain told me not to do that, and I did it anyway. Well, I think you answered the question. That's what's the important part of it. Um, here's an interesting question about uh, jurisdiction uh, between Oregon and Washington State. Does Oregon have anything comparable? And does Washington have any say in vessel uh, ves vessels headed for Oregon? Um, and then furthermore, a vessel going to Port Westward Dock in Oregon could easily cause a spill impacting Washington and the estuary. Uh, Port of Columbia County had a very close call there in November when a rock tug barge struck a diesel pipeline connecting tanks to the dock. The cost was enormous and there was basically no spill. Imagining the impact if it had resulted in a spill is incredible. So what's the correlation there between Oregon and Washington? We know. You know, I'll I'll, I'll try to answer this. I um you know, there's there are spills that occur in the transboundary waters of the Salish Sea that originate in BC or originate in Washington state and impact both sides of the border. Um, so even in that situation, there's coordination in the spill response. Um, and I'm assuming that uh, between Oregon and Washington, there would be, there would be coordination uh, in the spill response. And again, like I said before, there's a federal on-scene coordinator um, who oversees for all the U.S. waters um, in terms of the spill response. And um, there are, if you, um, there are a number of Washington State Class One facilities on the Columbia River in Pasco in Vancouver. Um, so we do have, you know, Class One facilities throughout the state. Thanks, Level. Um, Rick, another question for you. Uh, would increasing the cap for oil companies also help pay for more restoration in an event of a major oil spill? And how would this change the OSLTF cap? What, what does OSL, OSLFT stand for again? Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund. Ah. That's a federal source of monies. Um, so if, if by cap, I assume the, the, the questioner is meaning the, uh, what we're asking the um, ecology to impose by way of rulemaking. Um, ecologies, the, in the rulemaking, they're not telling the oil companies how to use uh, the, uh, uh, the, how to spend the money. Um, it's, so in terms of you know restoration or versus cleanup, I'm not sure if that's a distinction that would is the distinction without a difference. But increasing the um, uh, the amounts that, that certainly you know a billion dollars is really I think it was a starting point. Um, Three hundred million is way too low, as Lovell's uh, presentation showed. There's um, you know a good chance of. You know, a big oil spill costing way more than ten billion dollars, and if that came from one oil company, then you know that billion dollars would be a drop in the bucket. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that overall the answer to the question, if I understand it correctly, is that yes, this would you know help provide for better cleanup and restoration um, if, if if the cap is increased. Um, but ultimately, it's really a question of trying to give a, a ecology a sense of how ridiculously low their current limit is. Got it. So I have two more questions. Um, and you mentioned uh, a billion dollars being a drop in the bucket. Um, one question here is, given the high level of risks and immense costs of response, damages, should we be requesting a coverage amount greater than one billion dollars? Wouldn't bother me. <laughs> um, you know, I think we, we we I should make it clear, we in this in the, among the panelists 
we looked at a billion dollars as you know uh, 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 really a starting point. It's not the ex it's not our expectation that in a big oil spill a billion dollars would be enough. But we're trying to get started in a, you know the beginnings of a of, of a rulemaking process that that hasn't been done before, um, and so asking for that is we think probably the minimum that should be asked for. But if next week you're at one of these public uh, events and you want to tell them that they should be asking for more, um, I would say sure. Uh, I, I think we need to avoid you know, doing things like they should be charged or imposed $100 billion or really high, high figures because something that's so far out of, away from what uh, ecology is, is now draft re requiring, it's just going to go right over their head. They're just not going to consider it. We thought a billion was a good starting point, but more would be better. I'll just add that, um... You know, the one billion is what's affordable for tankers to pay and, and to have in terms of a financial responsibility requirement. So we felt like at the very least, these class one facilities should be required to have at least that amount of coverage. But the real answer is we don't know what the right amount is. And, um, you know, if Ecology did go through an analysis in 2006 to identify that a large oil spill would cost the state 10.8 billion and 165,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. We don't know what it is in today's dollars. Um, and we don't know how that relates to what a worst case spill would be from these facilities. So um, I think the bottom line is we, we don't have all the answers, but we know for certain that the 300 million is not enough. Thanks, Lovell. And this uh, is a good transition to the final question. It, you mentioned um, today's dollars compared to 2006 dollars. So regarding the 30-year-old study that Ecology used to calculate the $300 million, in which you talked about, do you know why Ecology did not use a simple like consumer price index calculation to determine the cost to respond and pay for damages in today's dollars? Like it could be a huge difference, right? Yeah, I, I that's a really good question. Um, so Ecology in, in their rulemaking process, they did not consider a consumer price index per se. And it's also uncertain whether the consumer price index would really address the 30 year increase in spill response and damage costs. Ecology did consider a 600 million financial responsibility requirement. And I'm gonna just read a quote from their preliminary regulatory analyses report. Uh, quote, this higher level could have provided a higher level of protection for the state, but failed to meet the specific objective of considering commercial affordability and availability of FR, that's financial responsibility in the marketplace. Having to demonstrate FR for 600 million would require companies to pay significant costs into the millions of dollars per year to remain in business, unquote. So, you know, if the appropriate amount of financial responsibility costs millions of dollars per year, you know, um, in my opinion, that's just the cost of doing business. And, and that's what should be required of these industries. Thanks, Lauren. If I could just add on to that, um, I don't think uh, ecology has a real clear understanding of uh, how much the oil industry uh, and the big members of it spend on insurance every year. It's it's huge amounts of money, um, and so the uh, you know whoever's telling them that this is an unaffordable cost, it, it maybe it's true for uh, you know a company that that trucks oil from the refinery to gas stations. This is a much smaller company. But for the class one facilities, these are the big big boys and these are um, covered under the uh, insurance programs of the big members of the oil industry. Um, it's just not unaffordable. Excellent, uh, excellent answers. Um, so thank you, Lovell and Rick, and thank you for all those uh, questions that uh, our audience provided. We're going to transition now to the training session and part of the program. 
you're going to learn how to provide effective testimony. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to longtime advocate and activist in Whatcom County, Eddie Yuri. He's the climate and energy policy manager at Resources. And he will be joined by Katie Titus, senior organizer with Native Vote Washington. Well, thank you, Rain, for that introduction and uh, props to our other panelists tonight. And thank you all for being here and engaging in this process. Um, this uh, Now, while there are a lot of technical aspects of this, you don't need to know everything in order to make a difference and have an impact in helping us push for a stronger rule. Last year, the folks here on the panel were involved in a series of meetings with uh, with ecology and other stakeholders in the previous, you know, preliminary input and in drafting this rule. We were greatly outnumbered by folks who worked for the oil industry. Those are usually the folks who most show up and engage in these kinds of rule makings and have the most, you know, ability to invest in it. And the only way we can counter that influence, you know, us just being handful of folks working for nonprofits is by really amplifying our message with calls from the community and, and folks, you know, constituents of Washington state, amplifying our message and pushing for this. So uh, while there will be a place to make written comments, of course, and we'll be, we'll be sharing our written comments with you as we move through this process, you know, those are due on March 8th, we have a little bit of time. Um, just next week, there are public hearings coming up. Uh, virtual online on Zoom, same way you access, uh, we're able to access this webinar. Uh, and we want to encourage you to speak. And, you know, to recap uh, some of what we went over today and, you know, in simple terms, um, some of the key message points, what we're going to be calling for. Simply put, no matter what, we just, we simply cannot afford a major oil spill. The, the cost of a response, the, the damage to ecosystems to communities health of a salish sea that's already so de so degraded and on the brink of collapse and that we're desperately working to save across the board we simply just cannot let, let this happen but if it does and not necessarily you know the largest kinds of spill of an exxon valdez scale but even the more common smaller skills that still have an impact on fish and wildlife we need to make sure that we have enough and that those who are responsible are demonstrating their ability to pay we need to make this world stronger. We need to raise the amount. $300 million is not enough, in a, especially in a worst case scenario where, you know, as we showed, as Level was saying earlier, $10.8 billion, that was an estimate from like 20 years ago. The cost could be even well more than that. Um, so pushing for a higher requirement, especially for those class one facilities, the largest oil carriers. And we want the financial responsibility requirements to prioritize sufficient compensation for oil spill impacts over oil industry profits. The oil industry will say, you know, this, oh, it's the cost, it's the cost to us. But the fact is, is that they, they can't afford it. There is a way. Um, and especially since those profits are greatly enhanced by the industry's use of externalized costs. I mean, we need to factor in what the true cost of it. And part, part of that is, yeah, paying for insurance to be able to cover a damage because the risks are so high. These ships are moving through the Salish Sea, through Southern resident killer whale habitat all the time. The trucks are driving on our roads, the trains are moving through our communities. But there's also, of course, oil coming into the state by pipeline. And, in, and also not just crude oil, but diluent bitumen made from tar sands, heavy tar-like substance, it's diluted to flow through pipelines. It's moving underneath uh, you know, fish passageways, rivers through Washington, through parks, streams, coming to our refineries. And if a spill from tar sands, it's worse, it, sink, it doesn't float on the surface of water, it sinks, it's a whole other thing to spill, there's a much greater cost. We need to differentiate that from conventional crude oil. And so we're calling for that in this rule as well. Um, guess we'll go to the next slide. And uh, of course, I'll come back to making sure you have what you need to be able to participate in any form you can in this. Uh, but we, if you can come next week to the hearings, dial in online, just like you did. There's a few times a day next week we just want to give you a little tips and tricks to, to help prepare you make it because, you know, sometimes it can be intimidating coming to these public hearings. I've been through a number of them myself and it doesn't always get easier. Um, this will only be virtual, right? A little bit different than the in-person format, unfortunately, um, but it makes it a little easier to get to. Um, and you don't have to get overly technical. You know, you can prepare a written, like a, a robust written comment and come and read that, but 
really the, the, the public hearings are really about making, you know, getting the, the general message and the, and the getting the and get, getting the values across and the real reasons for why we need a stronger rule. It's a place to personalize and make this meaningful. So first, you don't have, there's no one way to do this. You know, you, where you're coming from, uh, we encourage you to speak, you know, whatever you have to say, but recommend to start and you know, introduce yourself. Where do you live uh, or where have you lived that is uh, connected to this issue where, and, and what was any kind of personal experience you can draw on, whether it's, you know, seeing oil trains go by your home or when you're at the beach, whether it's, uh, you know, going to the beaches uh, and bird watching or, or going out on the water and enjoying, you know, the ecosystems that are endangered here. Do you have any kind of credentials or affiliations? Um, good to cite those. Um, doesn't have to be directly related to this. If you know you're you're a teacher, or you're a medical professional, anything you know, just a little bit about who you are. Um, acknowledge if you have connections to groups, but if you're not speaking officially on behalf of a group, you don't have to state that. But the main thing is, yeah, state what your stake is. How are you connected? How, what do you stand to lose from an oil spill? How are how are you going to be harmed? How, and people you care about, the ecosystems you care about. Um, but then when it comes to what's specifically, of course, being proposed. We want to speak to that, not just the broader issue. There's a actually there's a concrete rule. There's language on the table that we're trying to change. Name specific problems in, in it, like the points we highlighted just now, and ask for a specific change. And try so you know, and then of course you know wrap it up graciously with you know, keeping in mind that you know the agency staff who are here listening to the comments who are working on this rule, you know they're just they're they're working people. They're doing their best. Uh, and we want to encourage them to really take us seriously and really listen to us and not just, you know, say that they took public comment. Um, and if we want to go to the, uh, the next slide as well, uh, we do recommend good to be concise, uh, whether or not there's, there's a time limit. Um, typically, yeah, aiming for two minutes is good. Speak slowly at a good pace, make it clear and enunciate uh, so that the, it's like clear on the record what you said and so that you aren't misinterpreted as best you can. Of course, be polite. Um, while there's you know, a lot to be mad about or get um, inflamed about sometimes when we're dealing with the fossil fuel industry, it, it always, it's best to be you know, calm and considerate and, and, and don't undermine our points by, um, you know, getting, uh, over, by being accusatory or, or going on the attack necessarily. So but the, and it really just tell a story. Who are you, where you live, what's your stake, why you care, if you have personal witness, we can make more you can make it into a narrative i think the more impact we'll have as far as pushing for those technical changes to this rule that we want helps to write things out in advance of course so you can make sure that you say what you you, you want to say when you come um, and practice it beforehand and in a moment here we're going to have uh someone demonstrate a comment uh our friend katie titus from from washington conservation action uh and first i guess well yeah we'll go to this last slide first to make sure you have what you need um there will be links. Uh, well, there's links here. There's actually no pre-registration for these virtual public hearings. So you have to click one of those links. Of course, we're going to send a follow-up email, make sure you have that in front of you. And if you have any trouble, of course, you can contact us. Uh, but you'll have click a, one of those Zoom links, join the meeting at the specified time. It could be in the afternoon, in the evening, or the morning, 27th, 28th, 29th, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, and of course, uh, you can also submit a comment online. We'll be following up on that, but I've included the link in the slide there, which I think is clickable, um, to go straight to the online comment form where you can you can fill that in before the deadline on March 8th. Uh, and now I guess we're just going to kind of just do a quick demo, um, act like this is a public hearing. Uh, <laughs> um, if Katie, you're ready, I'll, I'll I'll pretend to be the 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 uh, hearing official. The official with the Washington State Department of Ecology, calling the here to order. Next speaker, Katie Titus. Thank you. Hello, my name is Katie Titus. I'm Koi Khan Athabaskan from the interior of Alaska. I've been living in Eastern Washington for the past 10 years. I was just a baby when Exxon Valdez spilled 11 million gallons of crude oil into the Prince William Sound. The oil covered 1,300 miles of coastline and killed hundreds of thousands of animals and sea life. Though I grew up 350 miles from Prince William Sound, the effects of the oil spill rippled through all of the native communities within Alaska. There are 29 or 229 tribes in Alaska, most of which still live a subsistence lifestyle, including mine. 
meaning they feed their families with what they can, what they're able to hunt, fish, and gather, and nothing goes to waste. As a child, I remember my community members talking about the spill, how it was affecting our relatives on the coast, and how it was going to affect our own hunting and fishing abilities since we are all connected. I remember my community organizing fundraisers, gathering resources, and sending our people down every summer throughout the years to continue to clean up efforts. This wasn't just a point in time effort either. This was a yearly event into my adulthood. It is estimated that Exxon Valdez killed 250,000 seabirds that are used for eggs, food, and trade in our communities. 3,000 otters, which, are you, which is 3,000 meals for just one family and material for our winter clothing. 300 seals, just one seal can feed an entire village. And 22 killer whales, one whale can feed a whole, a whole subregion of villages across the North Slope. Exxon paid $2 billion in cleanup costs and $1.8 billion for habitat restoration. But it has been 35 years since that oil spill and pockets of crude oil still remain on the shores. Wildlife numbers have not restored to pre-spill numbers, and it is thought to have played a part in the collapse of Alaska salmon and herring numbers now. Canada Trans Mountain Pipeline through Puget Sound, which transports Alberta tar sands to Washington State's northern refineries. A spill in this area could directly impact the Salish Sea and all the rivers and communities connected to it. Tar sand is more difficult to clean up than crude oil and should have a financial responsibility requirement that is based on a higher per barrel amount in order to address the higher oil spill response and damage cost for the spill of tar sand products. The per barrel cost for the Trans Mountain Pipeline should be increased to effectively take care of cleanup and habit habitat restoration. Thank you, Eddie, for letting allowing me to comment at this point and on such an important issue. Well, that was awesome. Uh, you came in at, I think, uh, it's like a, a little past two and a half minutes, but well under three. Really, it was good. It was solid length and you covered a lot. I think you know, what, I, what I really liked was uh, you made it personal and you, you told a story. You really emphasized the why you know, telling your, your personal connection to it, where you're from. Um, and you included some real facts and figures, you know, both historically about Exxon Valdez spill and the devastation that caused um, and the aftermath of it. You also really honed in on a point about Can Canada's trans mountain pipeline and, and uh, addressing, you know, the, the added risk of tar sands and you made a clear ask at the end. Uh, so I think that was really just a great example. Uh, and. Of, of course, you know, everyone was going to come and do this your own way. And um, if, you, if anyone who's looking for help and preparing comments, you know, we hope that you can come to us and, and, uh, and, and follow up. And I guess I'm going to kick it over to Rain to wrap up our, our webinar this evening. But really, yeah, thank you all for, for uh, being part of this. Yeah, thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Katie. Um, one uh, tip for folks when they do... Uh, prepare their testimony is to have it written down. Um, you're in practice a few times. Uh, Katie did a wonderful job. And if you run out of time and they cut you off, you have something to submit to them in writing afterwards. So you can always follow up uh, with that. So on that note, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you in advance for attending one of the three public hearings next week. And with a show of hands in chat, how many people are committing to going to one of the three hearings next week? You can say, me, I, I'll be there. I'm waiting. All right, Laura Ackerman from Spokane, Washington. Tom Glade from Anacortes. Ned from I don't know where, and Arthur, is that from Grace Harbor? No, that's not an RD, but I know RD is on the call. So thank you, everyone. We'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the recording uh, and links to the public hearing and link to submit your comments. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact Lovell, not me. 
And so good night, everyone. And let's really make a difference. Good night.